Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway, happy new year and welcome to the first review of 2020. So welcome back folks, I hope you're all raring to go, ready to see some amazing models this year. I'm definitely ready to go, so let's get to it. Today's Loco is a brand new one, I was expecting it to be released back in October and I've had to wait all this time. Uh, eventually it came over the Christmas break, so naturally I've put it to be reviewed first. The Loco cost me £72 and it is this, the Hornby 48DS Ruston Shunter in the Queen Anne livery, which was my personal favourite of the original liveries that Hornby announced. As you can see though, we don't just have the Rust and Shunter. If you look at the box, we also have this Conflat wagon as well, which quite comically is even bigger than the engine itself, which is saying something. Not many locos can claim that, can they? But it's not just a generous inclusion, although it is quite generous. It's not just there to look nice. The reason it's there is because obviously shunters of this size, um, we've seen this in the past with the likes, not really of the Peckets, but with tiny little locos, they tend to struggle over not just point work, but over curves, over track, over different rail joins. Because there's only four wheels picking up power from the track, reliability has always been a problem. And that's where this wagon comes in. This wagon also picks up power as well as the loco, which hopefully will mean that we can wave goodbye to all those reliability issues. Hopefully it means that this will run perfectly even over the most challenging pieces of track, for example, the Insul Frog Express points, I guess. Now, I do have a few questions about these. First of all, can you disconnect the wagon? Because obviously, if you've just got this wagon at the front of the train all the time, it's gonna be a bit samey, you can't be creative really, it might affect your shunting. And if you can get rid of it nice and easily, how does the Loco run on its own? That would be very interesting. And I suppose, as an extension of that, is this the start of something new? Are we going to see more pickups inside rolling stock? Maybe one day will our locos not have pickups on them anymore? Will there be a standard electrical coupling which will allow us to connect all sorts of rolling stock together and have pickups on every wheel? Well, maybe. It'd be very interesting to see how they've done it. And it will be interesting to see how they've done this wagon as well. Is it going to have pickups going to each wheel? Is it going to have pickups through the bearings, which will reduce the friction? Is it going to have pickups just going to the axles to reduce the building costs? How have they done this? Well, I'm now waffling on, so let's get this out. Let's see what it's like. I've not had my hands on one of these up until now, so let's get this out for the very first time and find out together. Okay, give it a try. So let's take a look at the packaging then. I must say, first of all, I wasn't expecting the box to be as large as this. I mean, it makes sense, obviously, the wagon will add some length to it. But nonetheless, I was surprised when this came and the box was so big. It's not really an important issue though, is it? Uh, the other thing that I can notice, even from the image on the front of the box, is that the wire connecting the shunter and the wagon is a little bit messy. I can see that they haven't tried to incorporate it into the drawbar or something like that, which is a little bit of a shame. And I did notice that with the uh, review samples, uh, not review samples, with the, you know, the painted samples that Hornby posted online. They did look a little bit dodgy on those as well. So it doesn't seem as though Hornby have done something really innovative with that uh, electrical connection, but we'll see how it goes either way. So if I show you the end of the box, you can see the product code here, which is R3707. It's the Ruston and Hornsby. Uh, no, that's not supposed to say Hornby, although it's supposed, I suppose it does look a bit like a, a misspelling. It's a 48DS and flatbed wagon, Longbourn Distillery. And that's basically all there is to see. If I flip the box over, you can see this is uh, 48 horsepower. Is that, does that mean horsepower? I'm guessing so. Anyway, that's what it is. There's a brief history of the shunters. If you'd like to pause and read that, feel free to, although I will tell you a little bit about them later on. And then on the far side here, on the right hand side, you've got some diagrams that Hornby drew, presumably, to help them make the model, as always, dated 2018. So yeah, two years ago now, crikey, it just shows you how long these things take to produce, doesn't it? Anyway, shall we uh, get this out then, stop messing about and see what this is actually like. Uh, really, really looking forward to this, actually. So, I, did I actually take, I don't think I actually took the cover off this box when, I, when it first arrived, actually. Oh my gosh, wow. I mean, you can kind of get a sense of how tiny the shunter is compared with the wagon on the box, that's true. But look how small it is. I still wasn't expecting it to be that tiny. Now, it's clear to see why the wagon is necessary. Uh, it's a very good thing that they've included that, otherwise I can definitely see that having trouble on the points. 
the distance between the driving wheels there must be the smallest I've ever seen on any model. That is incredibly small. Right, well, let's get this out. I must say it's very light though, although seeing the size of it, that shouldn't be a big surprise, should it? Right, let's grab this out. Man, the Hornby packaging looking particularly glossy this year. Okay, so we've got a little ticket here. What does it say? 48 DS body removal. Okay, let's see what this says. So you need to ensure that the front and rear sockets are pushed into the chassis before attempting to remove the body. Hmm, that sounds interesting. Well, I might have to give that a try at some point then, although that fills me with dread. I'd prefer a couple of screws if that's all right. Uh, then here we have the operating and maintenance instructions for the 48DS and flatbed wagon. Let's take a look inside. There we go. Oh yes, it's reasonably basic stuff. Lubrication, or oh, body removal. It seems there are screws. Eh? I wonder if that was to do with the couplings then. I don't know. We'll figure it out, won't we? Uh, there's a little shot there of the insides. Looks a bit similar, really, to the Peckett mechanism, I suppose. And yes, it takes the same decoder, I think, to the Peckets as well. Incredible, really, that you can fit a decoder into such a tiny engine. Crazy, crazy stuff. Right, shall we try and get this out then? Find out what it's like at long last? Yes, I think we should. Right, Ooh, this is very, very tightly packed. <laughs> Incredibly so. Oh my god. Right, the detail pack has shot across the room, which I don't think has happened before. It's not something to be proud of though, is it? Okay, so here we have what looks like couplings, three couplings, although I guess the wagon might need some. Uh, I guess that's so that you can change things around if you do decide to remove the wagon. And there's also some sort of plug, which presumably replaces one of the couplings if you decide to remove it. Yep, yeah, that's fair enough. And now then, let's take out the rust and shunter. Let's see what this is like. Are they going to be connected together, loco and wagon? Yes, it appears so. Right. Oh, wow. Right, quite a few things I've noticed straight away then. So the loco itself is extremely heavy for its size, I would say, and there definitely seems to be some metal, in fact. I would say the side of the cab, or in fact the cab itself, is definitely die cast, as well as the sort of lower underframe. The sort of engine housing doesn't feel like it's die cast, although I will investigate this a little bit later on. The second thing I've noticed is that there's an extremely rigid connection between the loco and the wagon. In fact, I can let go of the wagon, look, and it's, it more or less stays exactly in position. There's sort of no movement at all in that. Is that as it's supposed to be? Must be. Man, that's very rigid. Either way, let's have a look at the pickups. So there are just wipers going to each wheel, it looks like, on the wagon. And the loco pickups appear to be the same. Yes, quite near the axles, the, pick the pickups make contact there. Well, it's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, just the, the tininess, the intricacy of those printed details is very impressive indeed. So I'll give you a little history on the Rustons, and then we'll take a close look at this, shall we? And uh, just see what Hornby have managed to do with this. So the 48DS were produced for many years by Ruston and Hornsby, also known as RNS. They were a London company founded in 1918, and like many other manufacturers of industrial equipment, RNS also produced cars, steam locomotives, engines, and even steam-powered diggers. Who would have thought it? They were best known for their diesel locomotives, though, and this example of 48DS was produced in 1948 and was purchased by the Longmorn Glenlivet Distillery, if I said that right. The 48DS was a development of their very first standard gauge locomotive, and in fact, over the years, the type changed and evolved so much so that the wheels, the cabs, the engines, and loads of the other details vary quite a lot between the different examples. Okay, so there she is, Queen Anne, up close and personal for you. And yes, I mean, given the size of it, the level of detail and certainly the painted detail looks to be really, really excellent. But we'll get onto all of that in just a second. I want to address, first of all, my major gripe with this that I've seen so far, and that is the wiring. It looks a state, and it's also pretty dodgy as well. So yeah, as you can see, it looks even worse than it did on the box, cunningly enough. Uh, yeah, as you can see from the wide shot there, very, very messy wiring under there. I have to be honest, it doesn't bother me too much because, let's face it, if I'd done it, it would look an awful lot worse. 
but obviously for those who are trying to run an incredibly realistic layout, <clears throat> not like mine, I can see that being a bit of a problem. One thing that everybody should care about though is dodgy wiring and poor soldering. So if we look underneath, particularly on the wagon side, you can see that there's no sleeving, or rather the sleeving ends too soon on the wires, which means that you've actually got bare copper sticking out there, the two wires bare copper exposed, which means if they touch together, if they were to touch together during running, you would short out your controller and you would have the full current of that controller running through those tiny wires. What an interesting idea that is. And also, yeah, the soldering is really bad. We've got bits of wire sticking out there at that end. The design of the connection between the Loco and Wagon is really, really poor. And you can tell that Hornby don't do this very often because it's really bad. Yeah, a bit more ingenuity really with the connection between the, I keep wanting to say Loco and Tender, between the Loco and the Wagon. One thing that is quite good though, I've noticed there is a plug in the front of the Loco as well. So if you wanted to pull with the cab first and put the wagon on the front of the engine, you absolutely could do that. So I've got to be fair and say that's pretty good. Besides that though, the quality doesn't leave too much to be desired really. As I've already said, the Loco is pretty decent. It's got a lot of die cast on it. The Loco and Wagon together weigh 100 grams, and I'm gonna be talking about the weight and the pulling force and all of that stuff with the Loco and the Wagon together, because it looks as though you're only gonna get decent performance out of this with the Wagon coupled, but we'll test that later on. 100 grams though isn't too bad really, is it? Especially for a Loco of this size. I mean, don't forget this is an absolutely minuscule little Loco. And once again, the level of die cast is pretty good. I'm pretty sure that these plates on the side of the sort of engine cover are well at least etched anyway they feel very very cold to the touch and just look at the quality of the printing on there I can fault the wiring quality but the printing quality cannot be faulted look at that fantastic established uh, 17 something on there I'm, I'm pretty sure it's legible I'm just too far away and the same goes for the side of the cab really you've got more printed detail in fact that one's even tinier some of the text on there is really really tiny and of course the whole thing is covered in this gorgeous sort of yellow creamy lining which just looks beautiful look even the wheels are lined and the lining is top notch even on the wheels in fact it's top notch really really well done and it must be said that i love the sort of kind of chocolatey color isn't it i mean i would call this champagne maybe the sort of creamy color it's just unusual isn't it it's completely unlike anything i've seen before the end looks pretty good as you can see you've got this reasonable looking grill i don't think it's etched or anything like that i would assume it's plastic uh, but it looks reasonably convincing i would say and then the buffer beams are okay looking you've got that sort of filler plug there which is i think where the front coupling would go you take that out and put the front coupling in if you wanted to pull from the front you've got the buffers which are nicely painted but alas not sprung as far as i can tell I assume they would be sprung in real life, so that's a little bit of a shame, but not a huge complaint really. As you can see around the cab, we have got glazed windows as well as what's presumably, is that an exhaust perhaps? Probably. And little lights on the front and on the back as well, by the way, but the lights are not LED powered or anything like that, which I suppose is fair enough for the money. As I say, I paid £72 for this. Uh, the RRP was 79 I think. I would say it would be reasonable to deduct about £15 for the wagon. You'd normally pay about £12 for a wagon like that, wouldn't you? Except this has got all the electric stuff inside it, even though it's rubbish. Um, it has got value, hasn't it? So I would call 15 quid for the wagon, which leaves us at about £57 for the Loco itself, which I don't think is too bad, although it is pretty tiny. There are, however, one or two cost-cutting measures. I would say the cab is a little bit on the unconvincing side, particularly with the glazing, because instead of having individually glazed windows, there is just a glazing plate which fits into the backside of the windows and covers two windows at a time, which looks a little bit unrealistic, but it does cut down production costs, I assume, because it's so much easier to fit than the individual glazing. Inside the cab's relatively basic, there's nothing I can see inside there that's painted, however there are one or two moulded details inside there, little controls and that. Uh, I will try and get a good look at that at some point, uh, but as far as I can tell from here, it doesn't look absolutely amazing, but it's certainly not bad either. So for the most part, the painted detail is absolutely incredible. There's not an awful lot to talk about in terms of the detail and separately fitted parts, probably because the nature of the prototype means that it's relatively simple. However, that's not to say there isn't a degree of detail on this. I mean, there are some nice little separately fitted parts. You've got these little metal rings here. Not sure what they would be. Would they be for maybe tying a tarp around the loco? 
at a guess, maybe, I'm not too sure. And you've also got these very, very tiny handrails on the sides of the cabs there, so it's definitely not true to say that there are no fine details on this Loco. But it looks the part, doesn't it, and it's pretty unusual looking. I will give you a quick look at the wagon, but at the end of the day, it's just a wagon. It's not an awful <laughs> a big talking point, is it? But it's okay. You've got the lettering on the side, which is well applied. That looks decent. Metal wheels, of course, because it needs to have metal wheels in order to conduct. A reasonable underframe detail, I would say. Nothing amazing, but uh, certainly up to modern standards at the very least. The top is pretty good. You've got a slightly different shade of brown painted onto the panels of the wagon there, which are all nicely moulded. Looks very good, does that. And once again, we don't have any sprung buffers or anything like that on this model, but the back of the wagon does have the NEM tension lock coupling pre-fitted, which is pretty good. So that actually means that with the three couplings we got in the detail bag, you can have the wagon fully coupled up on its own and the loco with couplings on the front and back. So they've certainly not been too miserly with the couplings, have they? So there we go. Hopefully that gives you a good impression of the level of detail. Yeah, it's not absolutely astonishing, is it? And I do think the quality at this point leaves a bit to be desired. But overall, I think it's quite impressive, once again, especially for the size. So let's get this down onto the track. We'll try it with some slow speed. We'll measure its pulling force and we'll get it running and see how it performs after that. OK, let's give it a shot. OK, so there she is down onto the track, looking really, really smart. And uh, my goodness, the size of those express points must look a little bit daunting to a loco that size. We'll get it started, we'll get it tested in just a second. First of all, though, let's talk a little bit about mechanism. Now, with a loco of this size, I'm pretty sure the way a manufacturer would just approach this would be let's just get the thing to work, right? Specs aside, the thing just needs to work properly. And actually, I think given the size of the Loco, they've not done such a bad job. There have been a few compromises. Obviously, this actually does run just a three-pole motor. There's not a lot of space inside there for a five-pole. I have known tiny Locos have five-pole motors, like the uh, Hattons 040s. Um, not quite as small as this, mind you. Either way, I don't think it's a big gripe. We have at least got all-wheel pickup, uh, including the wagon. Obviously, it wasn't engineered very well, but they are there, and hopefully they do work. Uh, besides that, I don't think there's an awful lot else to say. So, 100 grams on the track, that's the weight. If you, well, I think I've already said that anyway. So, let's just get to it. So, I'm going to set it to forwards, see if it goes in the right direction. That'll be a, a tick, won't it, if it does. And let's turn this up and see how it goes. Queen Anne for the first time. Ooh, I saw it twitch. Oh, there it goes. Oh, okay. So there seems to be, seems to be geared quite competently. I must say that's half speed right there. And as you can see, it's not flying along, which is very refreshing to see. That's pretty good actually. Um, so far, it has not cut out. Let's get it right to the left side of the shot, set it forwards, and get it to really crawl. Now, I should once again say this has not yet been run in, and it has in fact now cut out, so that's me and my big mouth. Uh, so no doubt the, there will be improvements to the performance once this has run in. But let's see if we can get it to crawl for now. I mean, that's an acceptable crawl, I think, for a, a loco that's not been run in. Yeah, that's not bad. That's generally not bad. Let's try it on the express point then. I think that's what we all want to see. Okay, here goes. Hopefully you can see the dead zone there. I'm not going to be too mean and go ultra slow. Well, that's it. The loco's over and the wagon is over. You see, that was incredibly good. Once it's running, I will take the wagon off, I think, and see what the difference is, although I'm sure we can guess. Let me stop it, if I can, on the dead zone. Yeah. Oh, in fact, it has cut out there. Oops. <laughs> Does that mean the wagon's not picking up? Oh, no, no, it is. Yeah, that's not bad. So I'm going to get this running around the room. We'll get it running, and I'll come back to you in a little while. So it works. I wouldn't say we've seen it do an astonishing crawl so far, but I must say the fact that it did not cut out on the express points is uh, impressive at the very least. Besides that, it's very quiet. I don't know how much power it's got. I won't measure that until it's run in a bit, but for now, it seems to be doing reasonably well, doesn't it? Yep, it's good. I like it very much so. So I will leave this running for, well, let's give it, say, 20 minutes in each direction, and we'll see how it goes after that. So I'll be back with you very, very shortly.
Okay, so there you have it. Running in has concluded. And I must say it was very, very issue free. Never derailed, never stopped on the points, a perfect performer, reasonably smooth. I have seen a little bit of lurching. It's not the smoothest I've ever seen, but I certainly wouldn't complain about it, that's for sure. So I also measured a pulling force of 0.08 newtons, which actually for the size of the thing is pretty good. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in sort of layman's terms a little bit later on. But let's find out whether a little bit of running in has actually improved the performance at all. Let's see if that crawl is any better. So turn the power up very slowly and let's see. So that is incredibly slow. Is that? Mm, I can't tell if it is or not. Yeah, that is really quite good. That is a good crawl. I think I've seen a better crawl. It's a little bit jumpy, isn't it? But for a three-pole motor, that is definitely pretty good. That has gotten a lot better with running in. And I would say that is a trifle smoother in reverse. So it's decent performer. Yeah, not bad at all. So every test I've done so far has been with the wagon mounted. So if you want to run just the loco on its own, your mileage may vary. But what I'm going to try and do now is remove the wagon, which frightens me very slightly. And we will see how it runs just the loco on its own. So I'll be right back. Right, conjunction has been reversed, and uh, as you can see, the wagon is now separate. It's not something I'd recommend doing very often, to be honest with you. The plug, as you know, is quite flimsy, and I don't know how many times you can push in and pull out that plug uh, without causing a problem, without it failing. There's also no clear way to tell the polarity. One pin is longer than the other on the plug, um, although that varies depending on how you hold the plug, I've just noticed. Um, besides that, though, yeah, it's not clearly marked so you could get the polarity wrong in theory and cause a short circuit once again why they've designed this to make it so easy to cause a short circuit i have no idea but uh, either way i'm going to try and not forget how the polarity goes uh, the coupling was very very stiff it was quite difficult to get it out uh, which is good it means it's not going to be dropping out unnecessarily but a steady hand is definitely required right so first question does it still work without the wagon Indeed it does. Right. Can it still crawl without the wagon? Slowly. Yes. Very well, I might add. Yes, it's, it's not bad at all, actually. It's really not a bad performer. Uh, it's a tiny bit ropey. I don't know if it comes across on camera, but yeah, it's a lurches a little bit. It's not dreadfully smooth to the eye, but besides that, it's... Yeah, you can't fault it really for the money. Right, express point then, let's try it. Although I don't know why I'm doing this because it's clearly not going to work. <laughs> there we go, yes, it has stopped. But that just proves really the merits of having this wagon, doesn't it, if nothing else. So I'm gonna reattach this and I will show you what I've got coupled up. In fact, let me show you now. So I think that is nine wagons, including a brake van. So that's quite a lot, isn't it? Right, let's try the coupling. I'm looking forward to see if she can manage this. Here we go. Well, it looks like I got the polarity right anyway, because the controller didn't blow up. Right, nice steady coupling. Yeah, that seems to have coupled. Well, has it? That's the question. Yes, it has. I have noticed that the coupling on the back uh, doesn't necessarily return to the centre. It seems to wonk to the left or right. Uh, but on that occasion, it did couple properly, so that's very good. Right, let's give it a go then. Can it manage all these? I think it's nine. Well, ten really, including its, uh, its wagon with the pickups in it, which of course adds a bit of drag too. So pulling power, definitely not too shabby by any means. Okay, let me show you what else I have running alongside the lovely Rushton. I've gone with tiny vehicles, basically. Uh, they're all the same in one regard, except one. So there is an odd one out, see if you can spot which one that is. But here we have the Wickham trolley by Backman. Here it comes. Gosh, that one is tiny. I reckon this is the only loco I have that's actually smaller than the Rushton. And I shouldn't really point at that. I should point at the wagon at the back because uh, that's actually where the motor is. Uh, so I challenge anybody to get uh, a smaller loco. I must say, though, look at this. The crawl is probably a little bit better than the Rushton. Look at that. But, um, yeah, either way, it's not your review, so move along. 
And then on the very innermost line, we have another of my uh, favorite little engines. This is a, a tank engine, a steamer, of course. This is the Peckett W4 with a little bit of a good strain. So see which other engines you can spot. Let me know down in the comments which ones you see. And let's catch up with the Ruston and see if it's managed Gordon's Hill with those wagons. Well, I must say, it's an absolute pleasure to see such a tiny engine working so well. It's got a lot of strength. Uh, I think it's smooth enough to pass, that's definitely sure. It's easily reliable enough to pass. I must say, I, I was a bit cynical about this when I first saw it. I thought, oh, that's going to be fun to run, isn't it? But it really actually is. It works perfectly well. And with an unexpected amount of strength, it must be said. Look at that, no slowdown whatsoever. It's a deceivingly powerful engine. So do let me know what you think, folks. Are you impressed by the performance? <laughs> yeah, I'm impressed. So here are some of my ratings then for the lovely Ruston 48DS shunter from Hornby. So the level of detail was okay, I thought. It certainly didn't blow me away. The size was very impressive, but I think the actual level of detail was just okay. It didn't have any sprung buffers and the cab interior left a little bit to be desired. But like I say, given the size of the Loco, it's not too bad. So I've given it four stars there. The performance is definitely not too bad either. I've definitely seen Locos, even tiny ones, do better crawls. However, it's reasonably quiet, reasonably powerful, and pretty smooth, very good over the points as well. Now, there's a new category just there known as power in coaches, which is an odd unit. Basically, I've developed a formula that uses the pulling force in newtons of the loco, which is 0.08 with this one, as I've already said. And it also uses data from previous locos that I've collected in order to calculate the absolute maximum a loco can haul on straight and level track. So you might be thinking nine coaches seems a bit outlandish for a loco of this size. Maybe his formula is wrong. Well, no, as you can see just here, she is hauling nine coaches just about. As I say, it's supposed to be on straight and level track. This is not straight, this is on a curve, but you can see she just about manages that number of coaches. The reason I'm giving it to you in coaches is because most people don't really understand Newtons. It's not a very useful unit. So everything is gonna be in coaches this time, which everybody can understand. It should give you a good idea of what a low coke and haul, and it will also let you compare between different models. So hopefully that will be a good thing for this year. Mechanism, I've given it four out of five. It does only have a three pole motor. And as I say, some of those pickups were a little bit dodgy, although they do seem to work okay. So I've given it four stars there. The quality though is a three star, I would say. There's plenty of die cast and the separately fitted parts seem to stay on the model. The quality of the finish is absolutely top notch, but that soldering and the just the quality of the design really of those plugs and wires is a little bit dodgy, isn't it? So I've given it three stars there to be absolutely as critical as possible and still be fair. Uh, yep, I think the, the quality does deserve three stars there. Value though for £72 or for the £79.99 RRP, I don't think that's too bad at all. I've given it four out of five. I think it would have been even better value if it was a super, super detailed loco and it was top notch in all areas. But as it stands, it's not too bad. I've given it four stars. Overall then, that is a reasonable score to start the year. That is 7.64 out of 10. There it goes into the logbook. We're using an actual logbook this year. Uh, first, of course, because there's nothing else in there. The slate is wiped clean at the beginning of the year, but that will soon fill up with some lovely new locos. So there we go, not too bad at all. So that's very good. I can highly recommend this actually. If you want to pick yourself one up, I have links down in the description. Yes, I'm pleasantly surprised by that. That was an awful lot of fun. Lovely, lovely engine. So there you go folks, the first review of the year, all done and dusted, and I think that was a very, very fair start to the year, what do you think? 
Don't forget to let me know down in the comments what you thought about the Ruston Shunter. Let me know if you've got one. In fact, you could let me know in the poll if you've got one. And if you do, let me know which version you've got. If you don't have one, let me know which version you'd like to get. That would be interesting. There have been a few more versions of these uh, announced by Hornby this year, uh, including uh, quite an interesting dairy livery, which I saw, which was quite a, a nice blue, if I remember correctly. So maybe we'll be seeing some more. Let me know down below in the comments if you'd like to see some more Rustons. For now, though, that's about it. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed all the changes I've made to the reviews. And uh, hopefully I'll be a bit more polished with them once I get back into the swing of things. But for now, thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time. Cheers, everybody.